Hello, everyone. Thanks for attending our presentation. Uh, the talk today is about one audit, a security audit that happens on Zephyr, and some experience uh, with vulnerabilities that we have. So, who we are? Uh, I'm Flavio Solin. I work for Intel. I'm the current security architect for the project. I believe for the last two, two years. years, and before that, I used to be the security chair. And I'm David Brown from Lenaro. I am the security chair for two years, and before that I was the security architect. And all this time we are part of the PSIR team on Zephyr, and we have worked with things related with vulnerabilities and security in general in the project. So that is the agenda for today. First, uh, 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 introduction about you know, Zephyr in general, how we, the history about security on Zephyr. Uh, then we'll take a, uh, some time looking past vulnerabilities, try to get some insights from this information. Then we move to the audit itself uh, that was done, some lessons that we learned with this audit, and what is the outcome from this, right? Uh, which strategies uh, were implemented and we are thinking to do on the effort to enhance security in general. And finally, some conclusions about the whole thing. So uh, let's start with embedded system security, right? Uh, so if you go to the Zephyr's documentation and try to get a description of what Zephyr is, you get this, that Zephyr OS is based on a small footprint kernel designed you know, to be used in resource constraints and embedded systems. And by embedded systems, we mean uh, a specialized compute system uh, that perform dedicated uh, functions. In general, uh, with real-time constraints, and are embedded as part of, uh, of a larger uh, device uh, or system. This means that uh, the security for embedded systems is very critical, right? Because we are not only talking about isolated devices, but you know, devices that are connected to a much bigger and a complex platform. So. We need to worry about this. Uh, we need to worry about you know data protection. We need to protect private data from unauthorized uh, access. That it's crucial. We need to worry about integrity. Uh, sometimes these devices you know uh, control critical uh, process in, in an industry or a healthcare or it's part of a bigger automotive. So integrity is pretty important. We don't. We need to not allow that uh, when this device is compromised, this will compromise the whole platform that it's in inserted. So another thing, you know, when talking about embedded in this world, we need to worry about uh, availability, right? We uh, the system need to be responsive. Uh, so sometimes if it it loses, you know, if it's disconnected or it's not available anymore, that can cause cost uh, uh, issues and other things. So it's pretty important uh, worried about security and embedded system. So and what Zephyr does about this? What is Zephyr history for security? What can we do uh, to prevent these problems? Uh, provide security features is not enough. Uh, uh, software contains problems, obviously, and people do mistakes. And there will always exist people ready to exploit these mistakes. So. What we have to do is basically minimize uh, these mistakes and properly deal with the ones that will appear because they will appear. Uh, so what we do on Zephyr, what we try is provide a framework for developing you know, security systems. So we offer a lot of you know, features that can be used. We have memory protection using you know, MMU, MPU. Uh, there are secure boot. Uh, Trusted firmware. There are other features that are provided as external modules. So we have a whole Acer for crypto. So these features are there. Uh, we have other things like you know stack canaries, stack guards. So there are mechanisms to to to, to help to develop a software you know that contains some ways to prevent some of these issues. Uh, but you know. That, as uh, was mentioned, that's not enough. We have to deal with the problems that will appear. So, Zephyr has two working groups. We have uh, dedicated for security. We have one committee that it's the oldest one and it used to be the only one where we 
talking about security, we discussed security, we handled the, 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 the vulnerabilities and the issues that appeared. That is closer to the company's members, uh, but at some point we thought, you know, th there is no reason for most of the things that we are discussing here be closed. So we are talking about uh, improvements, enhancements, uh, and things that apply for everyone. So we decided to split this. So we created this security working group that it's open to the whole community, where we discuss basically uh, features and how to enhance in general, you know, security on Zephyr. And then we kept the security committee that it's basically dedicated for uh, talking about the vulnerabilities that are under embargo, and other. Th you know, minor things uh, that uh, related with budget uh, and how we, you know, uh, do things that require, you know, uh, money that uh, comes from the companies. Uh, so we also, you know, provide uh, regular, you know, uh, updates. Uh, we support the last release and the release prior that uh, with security updates, uh, plus the, the current uh, supported uh, LTS versions. And when we talk about vulnerabilities, uh, the way that we identify vulnerabilities is using CVs. Uh, CVs are a great way to do this. Uh, uh, it you know, provides a unique identifier, uh, not only inside your project, but in, in the whole you know, ecosystem. Uh, there is a whole ecosystem you know, uh, using CVs. So, there are databases that you can query to check if a product, you know, or if a specific software is affected by a problem. Uh, there are tools that can check these automatically to you. You can integrate these with your s -bone, so CVs are great. Uh, but how we assign these CVs, right? Once you have a vulnerability and you decided that that should, you know, be a CV, how you get a number assigned to this? So for that, you have to be a CNA. And it happens that Zephyr is a CNA since 2017. Uh, so we are able to assign our own CVs and publish them, and that it's good because we don't need to, you know, to, to work with a different uh, uh, agents or to, to, to get this. Uh, we don't need to, to you know, to, to synchronize our uh, vulnerability process and, and dates with them and the same thing for to, to publish, so we control the whole chain for, for that. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have on Zephyr App 13 that it's responsible to, once we decided that something's a vulnerability, to deal with this. So how we, uh, having a vulnerability, you know, created, a uh, CV assigned, that it's not enough if you don't use this properly, right? So. We used in the past uh, having this information available for the, for the members uh, only in the, in the project. But then we decided to expand this a little bit. So we created this uh, alert, uh, this mainly list that people can have early access to this vulnerability to know, you know something was figured out. So what is the plan? What it's affecting? How uh, I get ahead of you know, the, the problem for in my products. Uh, the policy for Zephyr to, to handle vulnerabilities is the embargo period is 90 days. Uh, we, the goal is that we have the problem fixed in 30 days and then we have 60 days to, you know, to, to downstream this, uh, the, uh, the fix and, and, the, uh, and let some you know, room for, for people update their products and, uh, or the software with uh, the fixes. Uh, that it's open, uh, this mainly is anyone that, you know, it's a product maker, it's using Zephyr, wants to be, you know, ahead of the problems. Before they become public, they can uh, assign to the mainly list. So, now we can jump to the vulnerabilities on Zephyr, have some idea of what, you know, we found in the past. So. To start, uh, let me just give some context. We used to track vulnerabilities using Jira in the project in the old days. That was okay, it worked for, for, for some time, but we still have some you know, problems first. It was hard for people to 
report issues there. They need to create an account. They need to sign Jira. They need to, to publish the, you know, the, to, sorry, to, uh, uh, to report the problem. And that was, you know, caused some traction, uh, some traction and people were not really reporting or we thought would, you know, was a, a problem. The other thing is, once we created the, you know, the issue there, when we were tracking there, it was hard to assign someone to look there because even our developers, they had to have an account in Jira to, to be able to see the, the, the problem. But that is what we had at the time. And then, you know, the, the GitHub uh, created this advisory thing, and we thought, well, why not we move it to GitHub, right? Since everything on Zephyr now it's uh, it's using GitHub, so we moved it to GitHub, and that was good. it was good. They provided you know a way to to, to handle this. Uh, it was much easier to assign people to, to to give visibility for people because everyone basically working on Zephyr already has a GitHub account, and people that were you know used to report issues to us also you know have a GitHub accounts. So that makes this. So the, the whole thing, uh, the whole point to talk about this, uh, you know, context is that all the vulnerabilities that I'm going to show here are from the last three years. That is since we started using uh, GitHub. Yeah. So all the issues are on GitHub. Uh, CV. I don't think I have. You know. Uh, Talking about what exactly it states, uh, so CV states for com uh, common vulnerabilities and exposures. So, and I, when I started looking for CV, uh, you know, for our past vulnerabilities, uh, some of the things that I really wanted to know was how frequent we are, you know, receiving vulnerabilities. Is this somehow related? You know, we we receive more uh, vulnerabilities as soon as we do a release or it's priority release or when we do LTS releases where you know we get more reports and so I query the data so I, I, I try to get this uh, the other information that I really wanted to check it what is the most common vulnerability that we are uh, you know, facing and what are the areas that you know these vulnerabilities are being found so uh, I, you know, we got this data, so the first graph that you can see here is the frequency of the vulnerabilities. Uh, this shows when the vulnerability was created on GitHub. You can see that we have some outliers there, especially uh, in the beginning of this uh, graph. And the reason is because in the beginning we were basically migrating all the data that we had in Jira to GitHub, so that is why we have this big outlier. Uh, the other ones, I couldn't find any, you know, it's Particular connection was not really, you know, close to a release. It was not after a release. The only one that I really know what was the cause that we got, you know, uh, some sort of spike in the number of uh, releases was in the close to the end of this graph that it's caused because there was an open source training, you know, for for, for uh, security. And the guy mentioned Zephyr and shows uh, some use cases on Zephyr. And then some of his students start looking at Zephyr's code base, and they found you know, the, some vulnerabilities in our code. <laughs> so yeah, so that, that was the frequency. And then uh, was, what are the areas? And what is, you know, how critical are these vulnerabilities? Uh, the majority is critical, so you can see, the, or they are, you know, or high or medium. We barely have, you know, low uh, vulnerability based on the CVSS score. And the areas uh, is not surprise as well, right? We most of these uh, vulnerabilities are found in network and Bluetooth that are, you know, bigger areas. Uh, complex. They tend to be more complex than the other subsystems on Zephyr. And finally, you know, what you know are uh, the most common type of vulnerabilities. Here you can see a graphic that it's uh, the number of vulnerabilities uh, and what what is the CWE. CWE stands for Common Weakness Enumeration, so it's a way to identify a class of each a rule. In the next slides, show what these numbers mean. Is what uh, because it's pretty hard to. 
to know if you are not, you know, used to, the, to this. So you can see in this graph that we have clear some outliers. Um, if you are curious to know what they are, here we are. And I bet it's not a surprise for anyone here. So the most common vulnerability that we have, are, you know, both classic buffer overflows, and they are followed by other types of, you know, buffer overflows like uh, stack and heap-based overflows. And yeah, that it's that's not at all a surprise. Uh, most projects, you know, using C, they unfortunately suffer from the same problem. So some conclusions about these, uh, and possibly some questions as well. So yeah, unsafe. We are using an unsafe program language, right? C, it's very prone to buffer overflows. Even the ones that they are not, you know, buffer overflows there, we, when we are, you know, creating these uh, issues, you can have more than one CWE assigned to the end. So sometimes you see, yeah, you have a buffer overflow. And then you have another problem that caused the buffer overflow, that it's an integer overflow or something that you use to do a math that, you know, caused the buffer overflow. And they are, you know, because we don't have many mechanisms uh, to, to do this in the language. And so, yeah, what is the other conclusion that we have? We have this sort of, you know, lack of awareness uh, about this sort of problem. People think that, you know, only think in the HEP case where everything works well, and they don't tend to think, you know, what could possibly go wrong. And another thing is, and that it's particular to Zephyr, uh, that it's a question uh, that are we, you know, excessively, you know, thinking about optimizations and performance and not caring that much with security. So ha Zephyr has this whole idea since the beginning that, you know, the application is trusted, everything is trusted unless, you know, it's coming from outside. By outside, I mean something that interfaces with the world. And uh, that it's not as simple as it looks, right? Because sometimes you say, yeah, I have this function that it's really deep into the subsystem. I'm not, you know, directly interface with anything. But I end up that, you know, the data that you are getting is also not being checked in the layer above and layer above, and you are end up getting, you know, untrusted or tempered data, and you should be checking there. So that it's, you know, something that we really need to, to reveal and uh, thinking about. And the other is, yeah, so network and Bluetooth, as I mentioned, were the two areas where we got more issues. And there are many reasons for that, right? Uh, one thing that I got, you know, talking with some people that reported the issues, they tend to use tools, automated, so fuzzing these, you know, do some sort of black box, uh, black box fuzzing network and Bluetooth, it's easier than if you need to do, you know, fuzzing the kernel. Uh, another reason is, as I mentioned, these subsystems are bigger, and they have a bigger uh, attack surface. And also, they tend to do a lot of, you know, parsing and bu copying buffer from here to there, so that, and as you saw you know, in the previous slide, those are, you know, the most common type of issues. All right. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about this external code audit that we just did, and so a little bit of background from this. It was three years ago, I uh, think so. Yeah. We um, there was a company out there, NCC, NCC Group, I believe, um, went off kind of on their own, and they decided to do a code audit of a bunch of pieces of Zephyr. Um, it's kind of one of those. You know, they say open source project, let's show what we can do as kind of an advertisement for their services. And we got this report at the end with, it, with it, I believe it was like 26 vulnerabilities in it that were found across multiple different kind of subsystems. And that didn't show up on the spike because it was while we were still on JIRA, but it, you know, big spike in vulnerabilities that all came in. But there was a lot of things that got fixed as a result of that. So. We kind of decided worked with the with the the, uh, the governing board because they're not going to do it again for free. You know they want they want money, and, and 
do we want them to do it kind of thing. So what is the benefit of, of an audit like this? You know, we, we have people looking at it. We have people doing training whose students then are motivated to go look at the code. But w what can be gained by an, you know, a company who is dedicated to looking at this? And th there's kind of a nice aspect of this, of having an independent entity looking at it. You know, you have somebody that's not working with Zephyr, because you're familiar with this. You work with code, and you, you just kind of stop looking at the details. And you just kind of assume that. And it's really easy to miss things. And when somebody comes in who's fresh with this, it gets a set of eyes that can see things that you know you wouldn't otherwise see. Um, but it has some other benefits there of the idea that we can say, well, we had this audit done, kind of helps with the idea of, of trust, that yeah, we, we're taking this seriously. We are looking for these issues. And we have some things that we're doing about it. Um, in addition, reputation, you know, th that kind of thing. So we decided to do this. How do we pick them? Um, and, you know, it kind of comes down to the, these, uh, th th these points here of what is their expertise? What do other people say about them? Um, what's communication going to be like? Because the previous one that we did, you know, they gave us a report at the end and it would be nice to work with them in the process of this. Um, how much does it cost? We have a finite budget. And just, do they have experience with Zephyr? Um, so we, we came up with a couple proposals and sent these out to a couple of them. We ended up deciding on NCC Group, the same people that did it the previous time. Um, but we have a limited budget. It's not just them deciding, oh, here's an unlimited amount of time we're going to spend on this. So we wanted to decide to narrow it down. And this was mostly a conversation with the board as we're, we're spending a chunk of money. How much can we spend? And where do we want to focus? Um, so th there's two aspects. What part of the kernel do you look at? Or not the kernel. What part of Zephyr do you look at? Because Zephyr is really big. Uh, there's drivers. There's subsystems. There's the kernel. There's libraries. There's all this stuff. What's going to be the most universally beneficial? And you find that drivers are usually focused, they're, they're important, but it's usually a few chips that have that driver, a few chips that have this. Same thing with ar architectures. That's going to be this architecture, this architecture. But there's this big thing that's the kernel that everybody uses. Um, the other question is how deep do you go You know, when you, when you look at it? Um, is it a bunch of things that we look at in a kind of high level sense, you know, well, what about all these interfaces? Or do we take some smaller piece and dive down and look at the whole thing? Um, but the other thing that coming into this is the, the notion we have some threat models that have been written, especially some of these things we'll get to in a second, that describe what is our expectation out of security? What is the threats that we are expecting to be attacking? Because it's really important when you do a threat analysis, a security analysis. It's if you don't have an idea of what the threat model is, you can be testing and looking into some part of the code where that doesn't actually matter. That's not a threat that's real in, in, our, in our situation. So what do we do? We focused, we decided to focus around the core kernel features of, of Zephyr, specifically user mode. So this is a, if you're not familiar with what this is, it's a separation. Most processors have the notion of user mode. They use random words for it. But the, the idea of you have kernel or system, and then you have user space. And when you're in user space, there's a lot of things you just can't do. There's memory you can't access. There's registers you can't talk to. And so we make use of this along with memory protection, that certain threads, and you have to make system calls, and they're really specific things that you're allowed to do from user space. And we have a, a fairly rich threat model written up about this as to what it's supposed to protect, what it, the kind of guarantees that it's expected to provide. In addition to that, there's kind of these mechanisms of scheduling, interprocess communication, those kind of things. And then a bunch of mechanisms that we would call exploit mitigation. So these aren't themselves mechanisms you would really use in your code. But there are things that can be enabled in the system that, if an exploit happens, can limit the scope of harm that is done by that, or what can be done when it's exploited. And some of these examples are things like stack canary, stack guards, stack pointer randomization, 
I'm not going to go into details as to how all these help because it gets really, really complicated as you dig into this and, and you know, why does randomizing the stack pointer help you and why is that hard to do on an embedded system and that kind of thing. So what happened? We went with the NCC group. Um, we decided to target, so we call that, we started with 3.6 and then there was a 3.7 release and it was done during this time, time issue. Um, and they worked on this, I believe it was six weeks, if I remember the amount of time that they had with it. And they came back with basically three issues. Um, there were two of them that we described as, uh, as low, low severity, um, roughly about an integer overflow kind of issue and a, a, the talk tau thing, which is where you check something and then later you use it except it's changed between when you checked it and when you used it. Um, and then there was an informational one caused by an integer overflow. Um, that one was interesting because it's a real bug in the code. It was a real integer overflow. You would allocate something and you would get back much smaller than, if you asked for this number with lots of ones in it, you'd get back an allocation that was much smaller. But we got lucky because the application never used the count. It only used the pointer, the, the size, the computed size. And so there was nothing to exploit, but it was a real bug and it could get worse, so it should be fixed. Um, am, I, am, I, am I doing this or? I can do it right now. Okay. So Flavio's gonna go back and. Yeah, so let's talk about some lessons that we, you know, we learn uh, from this out. The first thing is defining the scope, it's, it, it's hard, right? We have a lot of constraints. Uh, there is the timing constraint, how long this is gonna take. Uh, there is, you know, what is the expertise from, from the auditor? And uh, there are, you know, some time that, uh, learning Zephyr by its own, you know, it's a steep curve. So it's hard to pick someone that, you know, never have worked with the project and starting, you know, out the, and looking the code and looking as deep as we were asking. So that it's, that was really complicated. And also there is also the, the financial. Uh, we, these things can go really crazy, you know, price-wise in talking. So we have to put all these constraints that it's, that it's tough. Uh, the other is, uh, was mentioned, and it's how deep you wanna go. So are you, do you prefer, you know, go and cover a large area, uh, increase the surface, and but not go as deep in, you know, uh, in the evaluation, or you want to focus in one particular component, one particular area, and ensure that you, know, you have covered well that thing. Uh, the other thing is, uh, we don't want it to do uh, you know, an auditing, something that will change uh, the next quarter. Right, you wanted to make as future proof as possible. So something that you know you know that will be used for a long period. So ensure that the work remains that was done remains relevant over time. That it's it's important. And last but not least, you know, it's hard to to, to get these stakeholder agreement. Right, and you have a lot of people with different interests in different, you know, uh, perspective of what should be tested, what should be covered, what it's used for, for one, it's not exactly the same thing that it's used for others. So come up with these things that, you know, it's used for everyone, that everyone agrees, uh, agrees with, that it's um, not that easy. Uh, the other lesson that, you know, we got is, uh, we learned is, uh, threat model is really worth, you know, uh, it helps a lot when you are looking for this uh, type of service. It helps you, you know, guiding, to guide the, the out, so they you ensure that you and the author are talking the same thing, that you are not, you know, wasting time, that he is looking for the things that, you know, you have already identified as problem, Obviously, there are some rooms for you to, you know, to, to, to point different perspectives and things. But the, the, the general idea is the threat model is pretty good because facilitate facilitates uh, facilitate this communication and it helps to ensure that you know uh, you both are looking for the same thing. And let but not least, uh, having a good you know a comprehensive test, it, it, it's pretty good because you know you ensure that not only you are 
testing the right thing, that you are you know, improving your quality, but also helps the outsource you know, to, to tweak the test or to see what it's covered, what it's not covered, then it, it, it gives something to, to, to start. So what is the next step, right? What is the, uh, we got this report, we have this experience, what are the next step? What is the, the, the strategies, uh, how will we enhance this effort? So the first thing is uh, we, you know, we identify that most of the problems comes from you know, the language that we are using. There are some common patterns and some problems that uh, it's hard to work around. They boil down mostly you know, to, to program pro correctly. So training you know, in this area is pretty important. So we have talked with one, uh, there is this uh, training called Open security training, uh, it, it's good, it's open source, it's open to everyone. One of the guys that uh, have done this course was responsible to, to find a lot of vulnerabilities on the effort that we reported, the one that I mentioned before. So we talked with this, uh, the person responsible for this uh, course, he uh, thought it was a good idea you know, to, 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 to provide this to Zephyr. So it's linked in our documentation. We have, you know, we are recommending this for people that are contributing to if Zephyr. And we are working with the, you know, the responsibles for this course for in the next, you know, versions of the course, in the updated versions. Also, we will cover some of the problems that were found on Zephyr. So, uh, because there are a section, uh, you know, specialized for embedded systems and these sort of problems. And they had, you know, some examples and some past vulnerabilities that are used to, you know, to teach. And they were mostly based on Linux and other, you know, systems. And for the next version, uh, the, these problem, these uh, samples would be updated and will contain Zephyr uh, as well. Another thing is, uh, you know, a lot of these issues could be catched by, you know, static analysis tools. So some of them obviously know because you have a lot of indirections for pointers or you know cast for types and the tool it's not able to you know to, to go and follow this flow. But some of them were pretty you know straightforward to, to check. I, so I was uh, why we are still you know facing these problems and I tested with you know some analysis tools, uh, analysis tools and you know all of them catch some of these vulnerabilities that were reported. So. We make this mandatory on Zephyr. We define you know, a cadence to run static analysis. We define the process. Now it's part of you know, the, 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 our general process. And hopefully this will help us to, you know, to, to, to prevent some of these problems. And the other one is community engagement, right? We want to get as much re reports as possible. We want people to test Zephyr to, to find the issues, to report bugs. Uh, so there are, you know, universities, uh, people, researchers that, you know, published vulnerabilities in the past. We are asking them to continue to do this. There are, you know, some of these people, usually they report, uh, the reports that they do, it's not, you know, the, their main goal. They are working some sort of tool and just happened, to, you know, to use Zephyr as uh, input for the tool to, to validate the tool. So uh, we, we want that continues to happen. So we, we, when we talk with them, we, we ask, yeah, continue, please, if, that it's important. So now let's jump to some conclusions. Uh, so yeah, after this out, we, we have enhanced security, right? Uh, we didn't, uh, they didn't find a lot of issues, but they found, so we, that it's the, the, the most obvious. We, Fix this problem, so it's a little bit more secure now. Uh, the other thing, thing is, uh, we have now increased confidence, right? They look at, they are not part of our community. They were paid, you know, to do this to, to find the issues, and they found only these three minor issues. So somehow this brings some sort of confidence. And the recommendations that came from this report were pretty aligned with what we were we have discussed in the past that we were planning to do. So obviously they, they said, yeah, you should be fuzzing because that it's you know it's a it's a good way to, to, to catch it. It's a good practice. So that it's and that was something that we have discussed in the past. Obviously, you know there are some complications. It's not that easy to fuzz uh, microcontrollers and kernels. So, but that. Uh, 
was aligned with who we were planning. And yeah, so these are the uh, statements that came from the report. So they appraise the quality of the, 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 the kernel in general and how it's being tested. So that is reassuring. And now I, we are open for questions. So around the CVEs, the counts that you've got there, are they only for things that were initially reported as a CVE and subsequently fixed? Or does that include some number of like just um, serendipitous pull requests that fixed the bug and someone recognized as, oh, this is a security issue? And is, is it like any way of, or any ideas around tracking just you know, general bug fixes and assigning those to CVEs? Because it sounds like a hard problem, because obviously bug fixes can be related. So I mean, one of the things that's always challenging as an open source project, we don't have a mechanism to go fix CVEs in secret. Um, and, and I know the Linux kernel dealt with this a lot of, you know, bug fixes kind of become regular pull requests that you just don't talk about. the the security aspect of it and hope nobody notices before the, the, the embargo period. Um, I don't know, do you have any, do you know, do you have statistics on what things were started as CVEs versus, because we didn't really, I don't remember creating, there's not a significant number of CVEs that were created from pull requests. It, it's no. mostly been things reported and then fixed. It, to answer that part of the question. Is that yeah. because you think there's, that doesn't happen very often, like bug, random pull requests don't normally fix CVEs, or you just think it's... I, I think we don't notice cracks. them. There, there's nothing to tell us that, that, that they've... There's probably a lot of pull requests that fix things that possibly could be exploited, and no real obvious way to know that that's, that's what those are. There's a lot of pull requests. Zephyr is, is very active, and you know Thanks. we don't watch all of them. Sorry. <laughs> As an application developer that is really interested in security, uh, is there any document uh, describing hardening techniques or things I should be doing? For example, you mentioned stack canaries. Um, is there any place where you describe best practices? Yeah, we have a session reserved for the security in general. So we have this all document there. There are some best practices or information about, you know, the process on the project itself, but also how to use these features. Uh, there is a threat model that it's open as well, the one that we use it to do the audit, it's there, it's document. And we have also tools, there is one tool that we borrow from Linux basic and adapted server that checks what is your configurations, which options you are using in your application and give you some recommendations, say, oh yeah, you're using this option, but this option, it's not secure. This can you know, be introducing some problems in your you know, application or, oh, this feature that you are using is, is unstable or be aware of this. So you, this tool is also available and documented in the, in the project. Thank you. So have you seen so far any practical exploits that would be created based on the security vulnerabilities published that would you know, lead to some of the breaches in the threat model? Yeah, some of the, the reports come with you know, a proof of concept, so a, a way to exploit the issue. When we publish you know, the CVE and, and do the disclosure of the information, we don't put this there, and then we don't make this public, but the, some of them definitely can be easily exploitable. And others, they are more speculative and say, oh yeah, I know that this can be a problem, but I'm not sure how to exploit this, because create the, you know, the, the exploit itself, it, it, sometimes it's much more complicated than find the, the issue. So, uh, but uh, the, some of them, for sure, uh, we know uh, there are ways to. So if, it depends on what, which question you're asking, because if you're asking, are we aware of any exploits that happened in the wild because of something in, in Zephyr, and I'm not aware of any of those. Um, you know, we have these kind of 
white hat type of exploits that are given, but I don't have visibility at least into you know, something where an exploit was used for something in a device. Yeah. So the uh, code that has been analyzed, the kernel code, is portable code, platform independent. Um, some of the mitigations that you mentioned, like um, stack pointer randomization, is probably also platform independent. Stack canaries, to my knowledge, are a compiler feature and mostly widely available as well. Are you eventually going to go one level to the next lower level of mitigations, which are uh, platform dependent, like MPUs, MMUs, uh, because there might be bugs in that code as well? So um, if you say, like, uh, when, you're, when you're talking a bit about user space, um, such MMU, MPU probably come into play, and uh, there might be implementation bugs there as well, which result in security vulner vulnerabilities. So are you eventually going to go that one level lower? Yeah, so the, f the first out that happened that was mentioned, one of the issues that were found was in the ARM MMU, MPU implementation. Mm -hmm. So it was fixed there. And I believe that was also affecting ARC uh, MPU. Mm -hmm. But the, yeah, when this comes, uh, at this point, you know, the, the, most of the, the, the tests or the, the work was done in, uh, on top of KMU that use that they simulate in x86 with MMU. Mm. But uh, the, the, any of these problems that were reported, you know, went to that point was in a layer uh, above. And when talking about the architecture, yeah, for instance, not only about MMU and MPU, but the x86, for instance, have a, se a series of fixes is for a speculative and issues that are affecting only that platform, so we go this way down. So one of the challenges with that is, you know, the budget comes from a, a governing board which consists of a representative or two at most from each of these member companies, and many, as you start getting architecture specific, it, it starts to vary, because you have something like ARM where that's a good chunk of the, the architectures, and maybe that's enough to vote into, you know, looking into that, and then you have, you know, an architecture that's just one member, and you know that's a, that's a little hard. So it, it's hard to say where we're going to be able to go with that as far as looking into it. Because I, I, I know there's, there's some concerns, like I have with some of these MPUs have really significant constraints on what's allowed. And QEMU doesn't check that. And so everything can appear to work just fine. And there may be something exploitable there. And no, we haven't looked into much of that at all yet. And, I don't know where that will come, but it's important. It, it is. It definitely is important. You know, maybe we need to get uh, some kind of mechanism where there can be stuff done for one architecture that that the participants from that architecture are interested in, kind of thing. Yeah. So, good question, though. And I hey, so. Um yeah, I mean, I'm aware of um, many of the static analysis tools that we have, Coverity, and I think Sparse is another one. Are, are there, is there any other tools where uh, maybe in our code, our C code, right, we could we could annotate um, various pointers and, and buffers and such, uh, where these static analysis tools maybe have more information available to them to then go look, right, Clo closer to maybe say safe language might have to itself, right? So I'm not aware of any efforts on that to do that. The, one of the problems you mentioned with, with static analysis in C is C is very under, underdefined. Um, it, it's full of nasal demons, if you've heard that term before, of undefined behavior. And we, 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 we kind of sometimes push the edges of that because we're doing really low level stuff. And it means that the static analysis tool, it doesn't necessarily know what is this pointer for mm -hmm. and, and what is this, this thing. And there's definitely a lot that can be done. Part of the problem is, is it's usually specific to that static analysis tool. Um, you can say like, oh, this piece of data came from the outside world. Be scared of it. And, and do a deeper analysis based on this assumption that it, you know, 
it can give you the balance between getting 100,000 errors out of your static analysis tool and getting a few hundred that are much more likely to be exploits, but it's not something we've explored much yet. Yeah, yeah. so there are some tools that you, allows you to put some annotations in the code, but you know the project tries to be as agnostic as possible for tools, so we avoid this kind of thing. And uh, what we are trying is to be generic and you know then try multiple tools, so there is a framework that generalizes how to do this, That's it for time. Any more question? The last one, maybe? No. Okay. Thank yeah, you, thank guys. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.